This is the BBC. Dear brothers and sisters, all are welcome here at the Confessions podcast, whether saint or sinner. Hello and welcome. This is another Confessions podcast from your friends at the BBC. This is where sinful members of the public come to tell their tales of deceit, debauchery and deception. Seeking forgiveness from Sister Bobby. Say hello, Sister Bobby, as hey, you're actually hello, here. Hello, hello, uh, hello. Brother Matthew, who's hello. also here. And you, the good people of the collective. Now, this week's collection of tales feature Malcolm's confession, Don't Believe the Tripe. Mm. That was the tripe in the bin. Peter's tale, The Lady is a Vamp, the boy day upset thing. Urchin One's Tale, which was right down the line with the mannequin doll, and a classic confession from the Spice Girls, which we'll, we'll get to fairly shortly. But first, we're going to start with this. Tracy's confession. It's called, You're the Scream in My Coffee. I mean. <laughs> Very good. Simon Mayo's Confessions Podcast. Please be seated. Father Simon, I'm writing for forgiveness on what I thought was an innocent little giggle, but which actually turned out to be a very dastardly deed indeed. I was driving home from Northampton on a Sunday morning, having been to a fabulous book launch by my favourite author. It was a night to remember, full of laughter, meeting old book friends and making new ones. I was feeling a tad tired and had caffeine withdrawal, so I thought it sensible to take a break at a service station on the M6. Immediate brownie boys there. For me. Oh, <laughs> Depends which one. <laughs> oh, does it? OK. Yeah. In my desperate need for caffeine, I hastily grabbed my trusty mobile from its cradle and chucked it into my oversized handbag. I then dragged my tired self out of the car and I wandered into the service station, the craving so bad now my brain felt as if it were were misfiring. I inhaled the delicious aroma of coffee and followed the scent like the Bisto kid and like a true Brit stood in line awaiting my turn at the coffee counter. Now, stood in front of me, in line, was a young woman with her small child. I think he was a boy from the mass of blonde curls the little darling had. I'd say his age was about four tops. As his mother was placing her order, I looked down to the little boy and he was looking up at me with an incredibly shy expression on his face, to which I smiled politely. Just then I heard an extremely posh but very muffled lady's voice saying, At the next roundabout turn right (laughs) then go straight on the little boy's eyes darted straight at me then to my oversized handbag he clearly had no idea that in my haste for a caffeine fix I'd forgotten to turn off the satellite navigation app on my phone now the right the right thing to do would have been to take my phone out of the bag and show it to the little boy satisfying his curiosity but that's not what happened Instead, I looked at the boy and said in a whispered tone, I have a woman's head in my bag. (laughs) What? (laughs) I must have sounded like the child catcher from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang as the little boy's face began to crumple. His bottom lip protruded, his eyes became glassy and he began to let out this almighty wail. <clears throat> Realising how catastrophically I'd misjudged this, I immediately <laughs> really? turned my head away from the situation and looked to the counter as if I'd done nothing wrong whatsoever. Her mother was on her knees trying to console her, his terrified little heart and I could see from the corner of my eye that he was sobbing and he was pointing at me. Clearly the little horror was trying to rat me out, but I kept my cool, maintaining a straight face and a look of complete lack of interest in the commotion beside me. As no one else witnessed this dastardly deed... Or heard me utter the line, I have a woman's head in my bag. Yeah. I, I ordered my coffee, found a quiet spot to sit and began to titter to myself on getting away with it. On reflection, I feel shame for traumatising the little darling and I'm writing to, your fa- writing to you, Father Simon, for forgiveness. I don't think, I don't think Tracy has an iota of regret at all, if that's the unit of regret. Um, Tracy, thank you very much indeed. And it has it had it had a punchline in it. That's what I was looking for. And you can see how you can see that it could have been funny, but not if you're four. Sister Bobby, what well, do my, you say? Well, my big laughs are absolutely for shock, because I think the incongruousness of the situation. Look, we're at a service station, and you have to weave as much magic into that as possibly can. So that I admire. I love that bit. I thought this is going to be brilliant. I was so surprised actually by your explanation of your talking bag, but also <laughs> no. 
You are not forgiven. That is not what you tell a small child. You can tell them anything. You can tell them you've got a talking teddy, you've got a talking bag. I'm not, I'm not saying that I you can't lie. I have a woman's lie. head in my bag. <laughs> Yeah, Having in that said voice. that, there's a part of me that's also really impressed. But um, you are. It's the kind of thing. It obviously just came to Tracy. It was just an instant thing. It was just on the spur of the moment. She yeah. thought it would be absolutely yeah. fine. I said, I'm forgotten. Why men is unforgiven. Completely unforgotten. <laughs> And unforgiven. Uh, um, well, I think we are forgetting the mitigating factor here that Tracy needed a coffee. And I know uh, that unless I get a coffee in the morning, I am not a pleasant person to be around. Really? Uh, imagine I that imagine that. Um, so I'm going to say I'm edging towards forgiveness. I mean, obviously, I'd have probably gone with I've got a little woman living in my bag. That would have been OK, <laughs> uh, because because you know, the four year old's going to go, oh, how, how very charming. Um, but uh, I've got a woman's head in my bag. That's, no one's finding that funny. Uh, so, uh, but I am going to forgive because, you know, we all need our caffeine fix. The Confessions Podcast. Father Simon and the Collective. My story goes back to 1976. I'm in my mid-20s and recently married. My wife and I had purchased our first house on a housing estate just outside of Durham and our next door neighbours were a very friendly middle-aged couple called Arthur and Jean. There you go, different times. <laughs> now, I'd always had a love of dogs, but unfortunately, owning one had not been possible when we were living with my parents. However, now we had our very own house, a dog was soon on the purchase list. But I didn't want any old pet dog, Father Simon. I wanted a dog I could train and which had a real purpose in life. I therefore decided to buy a working English Springer Spaniel. I read many books on the subject on how to train, house and generally look after such an animal and I was told it was most important to get a well-bred working dog from a reputable breeder. To this end, my wife and I travelled to Wales to purchase our first dog as we were told this particular breeder was one of the best in the country. The dog was duly purchased and as it came from Wales, we called him Taff. OK. Right. Malcolm, and actually there's a, there's a note here added by producer Phil. It says, <laughs> Malcolm named it after the river taff. Obviously, oh, that's yeah. why. Because of the taff river. There you go. Isn't it a sweet a taffy? Different times. Yes. We'll move on. <laughs> we, discussed, we, we discussed with the breeder the importance of taff having his own kennel and the basics of training and general good housekeeping, including what sort of dog food was the best. Now, the breeder informed us that good quality raw tripe was an, oh, I should have said, by the way. <laughs> just, Now's the time. Just yeah. a warning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're way, having your tea, mm, dinner, any yeah. kind of food. Yeah. Uh, you might just, sorry, I should have said that again. The breeder said good, good quality raw tripe was an excellent food for dogs as long as you had access to such stuff. Well, it just so happened that a friend of mine worked in a local abattoir and he was uh, able to, sorry, Bobby, was able to acquire whole fresh bullocks tripe for me. A whole bullock's tripe is a rather large affair, so obviously with only one dog it was impossible to use the whole tripe before it started to go off. <laughs> this is not one for veggies, is it? It's, it's bad before it goes off, really. Now my wife was not uh, keen for such vile stuff to be put anywhere near our small household fridge and freezer, so in order to keep the tripe for as long as possible, I was advised to keep it in a dustbin full of water, as this allowed the tripe to be kept for longer, and it kept the flies off. A bin was duly purchased and was kept alongside the kennel at the bottom of the garden. This arrangement worked very well for some time with absolutely no problems. It was at this time that my wife and I planned a nice two-week holiday in Tunisia. Oh, no. And the trip was booked for January, <laughs> when, as you know, the British weather is at its worst. Taff was booked into a friend's... If you just joined us... <laughs> <laughs> Named after the river. ...was booked into a friend's boarding kennel for the two weeks, so all was arranged for a stress-free stress -free holiday. We very much enjoyed our two-week break, returned home feeling refreshed and ready for work. We flew home rather late, as these cheap package holidays often did, landing at Newcastle Airport at half past ten. So we're back in the house slightly after midnight, and I noticed my neighbour, Arthur, had his rear lights on. I could see that much work had been taking place in his garden with a small mechanical digger and a very large mound of earth. I decided to investigate and started to walk down the garden path towards the bottom. When I had only taken a few steps, when a horrendous smell completely overwhelmed me. It was, of course, the whole tripe in the bin, which I'd completely forgotten about. So holding my nose, I lifted the lid off the bin and peered inside. Or, sorry about this, Bobby. 
All the water had evaporated, and there was now a heaving, slimy mass oh. of putrefied, maggot-infested tripe. <laughs> Lovely. Oh. Yeah. That's why I chose yeah. this confession. A heaving, slimy mass of putrefied, maggot-infested tripe. Yeah. I quickly put the lid back on, just as Arthur appeared at the bottom of the garden. Arthur had kindly stayed up, knowing that we were due back from holiday that night, and thought he should advise me of the problem. He told me that the smell was obviously coming from a blocked drain, mm. and he'd called the council to try and find the blockage. They had dug down to the drain where several pipe lines met, but couldn't find the problem. However, the council workmen were returning the next day to resume their search. I was, of course, horrified couldn't bring myself actually to confess to the real source of the foul smell, which was, as you know, a heaving, slimy mass of putrefied, maggot-infested tripe. Thanks. <laughs> Seen them live. <laughs> that is quite a good name, actually. Isn't it? The implications of the truth could be quite expensive. I waited until the uh, middle of the night and, working under very difficult conditions, filled several bin bags with the offending material. The bin and adjacent area were washed with disinfectant and generally clean, so there was no trace left. The putrefied tripe was driven deep into the countryside and dumped out of the bags where it could do no harm and at least give the local bird population a fine feed on the maggots which, as you know, were infesting the tripe. Yeah. Work had kindly told me not to rush in the next few days as they knew I wasn't due back home till very late. So early the next morning, I decided to wander down the garden and meet with Arthur and the council workmen. To their amazement, Father Simon, the smell had completely gone. Imagine. So they assumed that any possible blockage must have cleared itself. How does this kind of thing happen? The council workmen roughly filled in the hole and left Arthur to repair his lawn as best he could. I spent the next few weekends helping Arthur repair his garden, even buying him new turf, which I said had come free of charge from a friend. I thought it was the least I could do. <laughs> but we moved house shortly after this episode. There's a surprise and lost touch with Arthur and Jean. So 40 years later, I am finally seeking forgiveness because I never told him the truth. Uh, uh, forgiveness for putting them and all their neighbours through such a horrible time. To the council workers, not much. As the foreman told me, it was a slack time for them, so they didn't have much to do anyway. So at <laughs> least I gave them some work, says Malcolm, rather uh, benevolently. So yeah. Very nice of you, Malcolm. Thanks very much. Well, the thing is, you can understand that if you're responsible for uh, an amazing amount of work from the council coming in to try and find the smell, whereas actually it's just your bin of tripe, which you hadn't mentioned, Who's going to say, oh, yeah, sorry, I should have told you it was my bin of tripe? I reckon most people would have done what Malcolm did. Let's see what Sister Bobby would have done. Well, She's looking stern. If he'd come clean, it would have saved them another day's work, wouldn't it? Having said that, they did go back and it was gone, so they decided it must have cleared. So, so it's not like they dug for another few days. But I was thinking, 1976, that was a big heat wave, yes? Yes. So I'm thinking the heat, the smell... But also, I was thinking of something else, which I'll come to. I th actually thought we were heading down CSI territory to, for a minute. I thought something much more sinister was going on. Murder? Yes. I thought someone wow. was going terrible. Uh, would have been um, a departure. But no. because you bought Arthur Turf and because you went out and did the work, and obviously Taffy was now on mince morsels for the rest of his life. It's just I think. Taff, actually. Um, it's yeah. just Taff, sorry. Because okay. <laughs> it's named after the river. Not anything else. Well, the sweet. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I think this time you're forgiven. Imagine that if there'd been a murder happened then. That yes. would be a whole different feature. Mm. What have you got there, Matt? Well, I'm going to say, I mean, you know, he was on holiday. They were on holiday. You know, if, 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 if this had happened when they were there, then they'd have been able to explain. But they'd gone on holiday, so then the council turn up. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm in his corner there, and I'm going to guess that Arthur and Jean worked out that it was Malcolm because he was suddenly being really nice and helping out in the garden and oh my friend's got all this free turf and I'm going to help you out and blah 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 I think they had you sussed and and also this thing you tagged on at the end about the council worker saying we had nothing else to do I'm not buying that so for that reason I am going to not forgive Simon Mayo's Confessions Podcast that's Malcolm's confession don't believe the tripe very good so still to come a classic confession from the Spice Girls uh, here's just a little teaser we were at the Brits and Eureka Johnson was there and I thought she looked absolutely great. So I gave her a smile and she looked back at me and gave me this dirty look. So as she walked past me, I slapped her bottom. You never did. did. I know did. where it came from. She didn't know. And then I went like that and pointed at everybody else. And we all growled at Hunter. We yeah. went... <laughs> 
Hunter. <laughs> wow, we're back in the 90s. The, the thing is, when the Spice Girls came in, you never quite knew what was. The same music was playing in the background, but you never knew quite what was happening next. What we're going to do is we're going to finish each podcast, uh, Confessions podcast, with a classic confession from the archives. Excellent. I think it's been very clear from the way we've been selling this that actually there's some that we would like to play and then there's some that we're not allowed to play. Different rules now, obviously. Well, yeah. different times. D- yeah. Guess how many times we said different times this week? <laughs> Go on. Even I said it this week. Different times, different times. Pen knives, different times. <laughs> different times. There you go, different times. <laughs> Isn't it a sweet, a taffy? Different times. Yes. We'll move on. <laughs> different times. Uh, these were, you know... <laughs> I think that's seven. <laughs> it's the standard excuse. Yes. It's, so, can't think of anything to say. Different times. Well, that is the ultimate excuse for the hamster in the plane and the goat... Uh, which we can't play which out. Which we're not going to be... I never want to hear the goat story. No, it's ever. really... Oh. Yeah. Do you not think? No. OK. Different times. <laughs> Before we head back to the confessional booth, a couple of new bits and pieces on the notice board. The other stuff that we've turned down uh, this week, I've, I've alluded to this because we've been getting a lot of smut. <laughs> which has yes. actually led to people saying, can we have an X-rated uh, Confessions podcast? Ruth After hours. Them. Can we have naughty Confessions piece? Mm. Simon, can you not put together an X-rated podcast of all the Confessions that are not suitable for normal listening? Lee in Brighton, Simon, could you do an adult version of Confessions <coughs> to put it on the podcast? Well, even Woman's Hour do a, do a late-night version. Late-night Confessions, mm. do you think? Hello. Anyway, so we had one this week um, about a well-known wonder drug, which... Yes, which we don't need to name. Everyone knows what you mean. There was a rude American, a waterfall, and an unconventional toilet break. And, you see, the thing is, I, I don't... You see, I'm the not... best thing about all this is that when you describe it like that, we've all got in our heads exactly what happens in that confession. And also, Simon, you're teasing us, but maybe there's lessons to be learned. Maybe there's things we can yeah. all learn by. That's so true. That's right. Mm. And there's the American boyfriend, the drunken late-night toilet break, and uncle's favourite armchair. And... <laughs> To be honest, that's, that's all you need. That's all you need to know. But I don't... Th- I mean, if the pressure builds, then maybe we can reconsider in terms of a late... And I'm not sure what the BBC would make of a late-night confessions mm. broadcast. Current climate. Because basically, the one about the mix... Oh, I'm confused. Am I in the shower or am I in the toilet in a French holiday camp? I don't think... That's just, like, revolting. Mm. Mm. So I don't want any more like that. David and Chester. Political correctness gone mad. Thank goodness... Oh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> anyway, it probably, makes a reference probably. to the Confessions book. Oh, oh does it? And even that I can't, that oh. doesn't even make it into this podcast. Oh, right, OK. Anyway, so before we head back into the confessional uh, booth, did you know here's an extra top fact from the Parish Notice Board? And I didn't know this. The podcast stays with you forever. Uh, in, in previous years, apparently it deleted after 30 days. Really? Oh. I just thought a podcast just stayed there. Apparently that's not true. Forever. Well, the podcast just melted. Just disappeared. So someone's deleting them. But not not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. Uh, and also there's a notice here to say that if you're a devout member of the Listening Collective, then we ask you to please give this podcast a rating. OK. Now, I w- I'm not sure about this asking for rating because it sounds a little bit desperate. However, I'm going to go with it and just see what happens because yeah. that's how people judge the success of a podcast. They look at that and say, look at all the positive reviews that this one's had. Maybe because yeah. I'm very... Imp- you know, I'm very open to influence. Uh, I'll just follow the star reviews. So, but, if you want to write one, that would be great. But what's the parameters for the for the rating? six by four? No, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't ask I for know. that. Two by six, two by two. I, what's the parameters? How much it made you laugh? How informative? You just was? give us five stars. I think. Just give how us great five stars. did you? How great did you think we were? Oh, okay. Just generally. Yeah. Well, if you think it's completely rubbish, you can keep your opinions to yourself. Yes, oh, frankly, I'm not Thanks interested. Very much. As Matt would say, <laughs> jog on. Jog on. Don't write that kind of stuff there. <laughs> right, another confession. This one is Peter's tale. It's the lady is a vamp. Dear Sat Father Simon and the fastidious founders of forgiveness, cast your minds back to 1988. By the way, we're talking about first gigs. Matt, what was your favorite first gig? Uh, Transvision Vamp. Cast your minds back to 1988 when Transvision Vamp... Oh, were, really? ...were tearing up the charts and their singer... Wendy James was tearing up hearts. She was more than just a lead singer of a rock band. She was the most beautiful lady in the world, and I loved her, said Peter. So did Matt, I think, probably. So did my dad. Okay, (laughs) thanks for that. Just putting you in your place. (laughs) (laughs) He loved her more than you did. Thanks thanks for that. (laughs) Yeah. That is... (laughs) Matt's going to remember that forever. (laughs) Just remembering now. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much. 
That's one of the it's one of the best put downs yes, I've ever heard, Bobby. Well done. Nicely done. Anyway, says Peter, I was at college at this time studying important things like A levels and beer and the opposite sex. Now Wendy had diverted my attention to the bleach blonde rock chick type, so I couldn't believe my eyes when one day, out of a swirling mist of smoke, walked Wendy. Not the actual Wendy, but as near as. She was blonde, she had pink lipstick and blue eyes, and as if in slow motion, she walked past me, this is genuinely true, winked and blew a mouthful of smoke into my face. Once my eyes had stopped watering, at different times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Once my eyes had stopped watering and I had refocused, I mouthed, hi. She simply said, flag market, Saturday, two o'clock. I might be there. <laughs> oh, yeah. She probably said it more like, flag market, Saturday at two. Yes. I might be there. Anyway, this is clearly going to go kapow in his head. I just so happened, said Peter, to be going into town anyway the coming Saturday as I wanted to pick up the latest 12-inch single by Transvision Vamp called I Want Your Love. Fate or what? My friends couldn't believe it as Wendy, as I'm referring to her, was the new kid on the block and so far untouchable by any student who dared summon up the courage to speak to her. The rest of the week dragged, time slowed down to a crawl and I became focused on one thing and one thing only, dare I say it, my might-be date. Having saved my best socks, best pants, T-shirt and jeans for the weekend. Oh, nice picture. <laughs> I was ready and primed. I was just about to leave the house when my dad yelled, Oi, where are you going? So I say, going in town to hang out with some mates. I didn't want an interrogation or worse, I didn't want advice. So my dad says, can you pick up my glasses for me from the opticians near the flag market? Anyway, I spent the next couple of minutes flailing my arms about like Kevin the teenager <laughs> and trying to visualise myself turning up on my might-be date, clutching my dad's glasses in a bag from my dad's opticians. Definitely not the look I wanted to go for. However, my protests melted away with my dad uttering ten simple words, I'll give you a quid to buy yourself a pie. Anyway, so I was easily bought. <laughs> OK. Timing was of the essence now, so I raced into town and my first border call was the record store. Here I located Transvision Vamp's 12-inch single, paid my money and then spent a short while staring in awe at the front cover, which had three portly men and one who were in the band, one beautiful woman <laughs> in a white dress with holes in. Hair dyed pink. Oh, yeah. Time had passed, therefore, uh, whilst I was staring at this, and therefore a jog was now required to get me back on track to the opticians. A young female assistant popped up from behind the counter as I entered, and cutting to the chase, chase and still slightly breathless from jogging, I said, uh, I need to collect glasses for uh, Mr Foster. The young assistant pulled out a few drawers, searching for the glasses, but wasn't having any luck. What name was it again? What name? She said nervously. I go, oh, for heaven's sake. The shop, you, you called my dad, Mr Foster, and said they were ready. Can you please hurry up? I've got to be somewhere. There was a hint of desperation creeping into my voice. Now, I may have been a little abrupt, but I was shocked when the assistant suddenly started to burst into tears. Uh, and she says to me, I knew I was rubbish at this job. I'm ever so sorry. And then she disappeared behind the curtain into the back offices. Well, at that point, I heard a little commotion and then a man came out from behind the curtain. Can I help you, sir, he said, with what looked like a tear in his eye as well. Surely I hadn't upset him already, I hadn't spoken to him. I ran through my request again and he repeated the search pattern of his female assistant. I checked my watch. It was now 1.55, five minutes before my big meeting with Wendy. I raised my voice slightly. How many people does it take to find a pair of glasses in this place? I have a date. If I'm late, I'm going to blow it. Please hurry. The man stopped searching and stood in front of me looked me straight in the eyes and said, A date? Just like my wife has been having with other men. What? <laughs> <laughs> and then he burst out crying as well and muttering words like cheat and rotter and betrayal. He then slipped back behind the curtain to join his sobbing assistant. What have I find myself in here? Again, I found myself alone in the shop. I glanced around in disbelief, wondering what I'd started, and I suddenly caught sight of a shop directly opposite. It's another opticians. <laughs> That's the one I'm supposed to be at for the collection. Well, it was fight or flight time, so I took to my heels and sprinted for the door. I bolted to the other opticians where I was in and out with the glasses in less than a minute, and that's including bumping into an old guy who I didn't even stop to apologise to. But I was in a hurry. 
The bells from the church rang out as I sprinted up the road to the flag market, where Wendy just might be waiting still. And there in the corner of the flag market, leaning on a lamppost... Different song. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong image. Yes. <laughs> was Wendy, and she was... She was alone. <laughs> well... And she was yeah. beautiful. Oh. And she managed to find the strength to make polite conversation and explain. I said uh, I was ever so sorry for being late. I had to collect something from my dad. And I nipped into the record store, but then my voice trailed off. I didn't have the record on me. I just realised, in my haste to leave the opticians, the first one, I had left it on the counter. I explained to Wendy where I'd left it, admitting the part about potentially making two people cry. Stay here, she says suddenly. I'll get it for you, and you can go and get us a couple of cans of Coke. Before I could say anything, she was gone in a cloud of obsession perfume. I sat and waited for... I later discovered. Uh, yeah. I sat and waited for Wendy to return for an hour and then two hours. And then with a heavy heart, I left. No doubt she was filled in by the shop assistant and her boss and maybe even the gentleman who I knocked over and decided I wasn't worth wasting her time on because I had made them cry or knocked them over. Wendy never gave me a second glance at college ever again, and I had well and truly blown it. So I need forgiveness on four levels. For upsetting the, up, uh, the female assistant, making her cry. For pushing the optician man over the edge. I didn't know, did I? For knocking into the blameless old man and not checking if he was OK. And finally, Wendy, for letting desire take over and being mean. I feel actually I've suffered enough having lost any chance of friendship with Wendy, but I still seek belated forgiveness and now bow to your mercy. Well, you know, you can imagine his excitement. He's got this vision of Transvision Vamp, and there is his own Wendy, and so you're going to do desperate things. Sister Bobby, what are you saying there? Well, uh, on the first two counts of the shop assistant and the shop owner, I'm assuming, Peter, I suppose you were young, and I do understand the situation you were in, and it's quite an unusual situation, but I suppose the advice there really is, of course, just be careful with people. You he, can wasn't break them. he wasn't to he know. He wasn't to know. He wasn't to know, and also, but, you know, sometimes just be careful. You think, you know, you can be wrapped up in your own world and forget that other people are dealing with things too. So be kind all you can, even if they're wrong, try and be kind. But actually, it's, it's, you don't need forgiveness for anything else. What I'm really cross with is Wendy, because obviously she just wanted you for your, you know, for your 12-inch. So she got that, and she obviously went back home and left you with two cans of Coke. Let's that's keep right. it classy, everyone. Uh, well, and she did, didn't she? She went back, got his correct. record. You're absolutely right. And then, absolutely, that's it. And yes. then left, him, yes. in the, left him in the place. That's absolutely exactly. right. Brother oh, Matt, boy. what are you saying well, there? I am saying, what on earth is happening here, having two opticians on the same road, opposite each other? This is going to happen all the time. A, a shop specifically for people who it's can't see very well. It's their it's, fault. What are you doing having the two shops opposite? This is it's a recipe for disaster. And uh, I shall not be forgiving because uh, I saw Transvision Valley uh, and they, they did Baby I Want Your Love three times, twice in the on. Have you not got any? It uh, turns out, no, they haven't got any other tracks. So uh, I am going to forgive. This is the place where penitents seek our pardon for their sins. Simon Mayo's Confessions Podcast. Simon and the Collective, for this confession... We've got to go back to the summer of 1968. It was the school holidays and there were three of us, aged 12, 13 and 14. To make it simple, I will call us urchins one, two okay. and three. What I remember of the holidays was that it seemed to rain a lot and that made it a bit difficult to occupy our days. What we did have, though, was full pockets. Definitely not with money, but with an array of items that would help us through the day. The hankies, lolly sticks, sweets, pen knives, different times, <laughs> fishing hooks, tin foil and toilet paper. The most important thing of all, though, to us was our fishing line. We never left home without it. The morning of this particular event, the three of us met up as usual. What are we going to do today, says Urchin One. I don't know. What do you want to do today? <laughs> Said Urchin Said 2. Said Urchin 2. Yeah. I don't know. What do you want to do today? <laughs> Said Urchin 3. This is the Jungle yeah. Book. Wow. This is the, the three <laughs> vultures <laughs> from, Vulture, from, uh, from Jungle Book doing a Scouse kind of beetly accent. Uh -huh. This went on for a few minutes. Then Urchin number 2 says, look what I've got. And out of his pocket came a safety pin. This is no ordinary safety pin. This was a great big nappy pin with a security device so it wouldn't come apart too easily. Anyway, after urchins, one, it's, you, can't, you don't get them anymore because everyone uses disposable yeah. nappies. But back in the day, 
this was quite a common sight. Anyway, uh, after Urchin's 1 and 3 scrutinised it, it went back in Urchin 2's pocket. That day we thought we'd go into town to see what we could get up to there, and our town had, and still has, a very big department store. And as you walked into this store, it had two staircases by the front door, one to the left and one to the right. On top of the left-hand staircase was where the women's outfitters were situated. And about ten feet from the staircase were the immaculately dressed tailor's dummies. We ascended the stairs and were walking past the mannequins when urchin number three says, I've got an idea. What's that then, say one and two? Well, you'll see, just pass us the safety pin and then cover for me. Urchin number three takes the safety pin and as we covered him, he secured it to the waist of one of the mannequins. Pass me the fishing line, he says. And another couple of seconds later, the fishing line was attached <laughs> to the safety pin. What do we do now? Well, how about walking naturally down the stairs? Well, we did as we were instructed. And as we did so, urchin number three was letting the line out until we got to the bottom of the stairs and onwards into the women's perfumier. Okay. Perfumier, <laughs> yes. Is that what they called them in 968? Anyways, the women's perfume section, Correct. where there was probably a choice of about five. The three of us now had hold of the fishing line, one at the top of the stairs and two at the bottom, and within a couple of seconds, the previously empty staircase was filled with about six or seven happy shoppers, completely oblivious to our fishing line. This was our cue. Pull, came the command from Urchin <laughs> 3, and pull we did. And the dummy, wearing, I should say, an immaculately tailored outfit, suddenly came to life and started winging its way from the first floor perfumier to the top of the stairs. It stayed upright until about the eighth step, <laughs> teetered a bit, and then hurtled head first down the stairs. Wow. At first there were a few gasps, then there were screams, and the previously happy shoppers didn't seem to know whether to go up, down, or dive sideways. To the casual observer, it looked like someone was throwing themselves down the stairs, dressed immaculately in a 63 piece, <laughs> whilst gyrating at the same time. As the mannequin crashed to the bottom of the stairs, a concerned group gathered around the fallen dummy just to check he was OK. Actually, he'd lost his head and one arm, but apart from that, he looked perfectly fine. Knowing it was time to take a swift exit, urchins one, two and three hurtled as fast as our laughter could take us for the doors. We managed to get out, and st uh, uh, get out of the store and over the road and hide behind a hedge. There we stayed for at least 15 minutes, not able to speak because of the laughter that was hurting our bellies too much. Now, I don't recall any headline in the local paper about marauding mannequin fell shoppers on shop staircase or dancing dummy comes to life. So hopefully uh, no one had any lasting scars from the shock of this experience. Maybe they even saw the funny side. At that age, we didn't care that there might be someone of a nervous disposition. This is taking all your ammunition away, Bobby. Oh, I realise that. We didn't think of someone of a nervous disposition on the staircase or someone who had a morbid fear of flying dummies all we cared about was having a little jape at someone else's expense however i realize now that i should ask for forgiveness from these unsuspecting happy shoppers as i'm sure they didn't get up that morning and think they were going to be set upon by a tailored dummy i hope you can absolve us from this jolly little jaunt that brought much mirth to us and a lot of terror to others says urchin one it's almost like a doctor who episode where a possessed a mannequin in a 60s door uh, comes to life. But it's not a portal into another time-space continuum. Uh, it was just a prank from the urchins 1, 2 and 3. I wonder if people recognise that department store and recognise the town. Anyway, Bobby, what are you saying there? What a lovely story. There's that time when, you know, you left home with a piece of bread in your pocket, isn't it, really? It's kind of 8 o'clock in the morning, came back at tea time a and no one worried. Why, why would you leave well, a piece just, of bread? Well, you know, that was the food for the day. You know, it was kind of, as long as you had wow. a crust really? of bread and you came back. Those, those this is just in London. This no, is like... it's still, because 1968. It's, you know, it wasn't long. People that... had cakes then, All right, then. you know, and, and chocolate bars. OK, there was a chocolate bar in your pocket, but basically you went out in the morning and you came back, didn't you, when it was tea time and no one wondered where you were and assumed you were right? climbing trees and up to nothing. No, you were in department stores, which of course are much more interesting than trees because they're full of sweets and cakes. There's part of me that really loves the mischief in you. So as an onlooker, I love it and would call you monkeys. If I worked there, I would call you monsters and you should know better. And, and flick you your ears because yes. people did that in 1968. <laughs> and I would tell okay your then. mum. So um, I think in this case, can I forgive you? 
thing is you could have really hurt somebody. So on this occasion, <laughs> you're not forgiven. You could classic, have really hurt somebody. Yeah, classic, classic Bobby. Classic Bobby. Uh, what'd you say, well, Matt? I mean, obviously, you know, as we've said, different times. Uh, these were, you know, it was, it was fine in the 60s. Uh, I don't know why. What, why were they carrying tinfoil around? That doesn't make any sense. What can you possibly do with tinfoil? Well, you can put it on your head yes. in, to stop the X-rays from the space copters. Simon okay. was reading my mind. Yeah, exactly so, what I was going to say. That's right. I'm reading your mind because I've got some tin. <laughs> Tinfoil on my tin head. Tinfoil on your head. Um, uh, I, I think what Have this... you never put tinfoil on your tin head? Tinfoil never. You get things. x-rays from space. Really? Yeah, and mm, you can read... That seems likely. ...special messages. <laughs> and uh, magnetic waves. Um, so I'm going to say this is down to far too long a summer, summer holiday. Summer holidays appear to go on forever, uh, speaking as a parent, and uh, and therefore kids have to find something to do because, you know, it's not going to be the end of August anytime soon. So I'm going to say forgiven. Simon Mayo's Confessions Podcast. Well, they were this week's Confessions. Uh, be intrigued to know who you forgave. Let me know. Send in your own uh, confession, please. Maybe inspired by one of those. Confessions at bbc.co.uk. But obviously, you know, we don't want any... I, oh, I was in the shower and I forgot yes. when I was there. for taking this wonder drug that. and look what happened. <laughs> because who would have, who would have thought? <laughs> Actually, the wonder drug was cowpole. That's what oh, it was. was it? That's what I was That's thinking. Was. Good. So, uh, so here's a treat then, and we're going to be bringing you some Confession Archive uh, every single week on the Confessions podcast. Something we unearth from the BBC Crypt. The year is 1997. Spice World had just been released, and they were fairly uncontrollable. So you're going to come down to the hotel on Thursday night? Damn oh, right. I don't know. Yeah. Is, there, is there an offer there, Sam? I don't know. Uh, show us your tongue. <laughs> this, uh, listen, no. listen to this, everyone. That is actually my tongue pierce. She's I mean, just her to tongue. It's Melanie B with the tongue yeah, pierce, Melanie, not, not Emma. Emma. Melanie B has had a t- she has a stud through her tongue. Now, yeah, what is the point? A stud. What is the point? I am a stud. <laughs> Tell me about it. But why, why have a stud on your tongue? Well, because I think, I mean, if if I don't like someone, I can just stick my tongue out and it looks kind of vulgar. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it did hurt, but it was all right. Anyway. One moment, ladies, to the business in hand. We have to do a confession in just a second. First of all, we have to say hello to our uh, collective who come from Photo Answers, the well-known publication with dodgy women on the front. From Peterborough, David Connor and friends, hello! Okay, hello, David. Right, so we'll do, we'll do the register first of all. David, Roger, Charlie, uh, Embassy, Eve and Sue Smith, Hello! Now before before we get to, before we get to the Spice Girls confession, David, yeah. we have some business to sort out because yesterday at this time we revealed the fact that your magazine had uh, given away a prize to uh, a, a very keen 16-year-old woman who wanted to be a model, but you'd let her down. You hadn't actually given her the prize. It had been a whole year, and despite all the desperate attempts of the of the, of the woman's father, uh, you'd ignore them completely. Now, have you sorted this out, David? Simon, it has been completely sorted, yes, yes. You sound very posh, you do, Dave. Do I? Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is an engineering feat, by the way, that, that beats Live Aid. <laughs> we have a thousand people on the phone and a thousand people in the studio. So what have you done, David? Well, look, uh, can I get Roger, who's the editor, to explain what has happened? No, because he's the, being an editor, he'll go on forever. So just yeah. tell me, is it sorted? Just He'll be very quick. I've got to put him on because he knows exactly what's been happening. Oh, he wants right. to get a word in, doesn't he? Fade him out. Fade him out. I don't want to talk to the editor because uh, they could just go, <laughs> they go on a very long time. Fade him out. No, get out. No, no, we don't want to do that. Is it my show? It is. Right. And it's confessions time, and uh, we know all about the editor because we heard about that yesterday. So, what we need to know is we need to know about the confession of the Spice Girls. Is this all the Spice Girls, or is this one in particular? Should we warm them up with Emma's? Okay, okay, okay. Well, Um, serious voice there. Okay, right, everybody. No, we were at the Brits, and Eureka Johnson was there, and I thought she looked absolutely great. So, I gave her a smile. And she looked back at me and gave me this dirty look. So as she walked past me, I slapped her bottom. You never did. did. I know did. where it came from. She didn't know. And then I went like that and pointed at everybody else. And we all growled at Hunter. We yeah. went... <laughs> <laughs> so can we be forgiven hey, for that with you, ghastly Miss deed? What, smacking Ulrika Johnson's bottom? Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. She gave me a horrible look. Can we do something better than that now? We yeah. can, we okay. can. Okay, moving on. Now, this this is, as well as a confession, it's more of a declaration. Can you make sure you don't stray too far from okay, that microphone? Okay, okay, okay. 
I'm sure you regular BBC Radio 1 listeners um, are fully aware of the fact about Chris Evans. He absolutely adores our single. That's right, he plays it all the time. He plays it all the time and bigs it up big time. In actual fact, Chris... We know, OK, the, your neighbours have actually phoned us up and the local police about the noise level because you've been playing it continually over and over again. In fact, you've been singing along to I it. I know she's going to say that. <laughs> not. So, so um, the point is, can he be forgiven? Who knows? For playing our singles. Yeah, and should he come out the closet? Well, I'm afraid. I think that's uh, no, the panel should decide. This is my show, okay, yeah. and I'm deciding that's not good enough as a confession. Yeah, I don't either. think it is. So I, I want, I want, a, I want a proper, proper humdinger of a, a rock and roll. Like you just come back from Japan, okay? Yeah. A, ja a, a confession. I want a big should, rock and roll, big time parts. confession. We have got a few, but are they? Yes, they are. Off you go. Can we do? All the shampoos and what about? <laughs> Right, we've got, we've got a few. All the wooden hangers, but that's not very. Oh, all right. Oh, what about um, what about what you said? We can you can either pick Elton John or Courtney Love. Oh, Courtney what? Love. As the oh, subject of the confession. Yes. El Elton John. Oh, I, I don't Elton think Elton John. John. That's too racy. Right. Okay. Courtney Love. Do you want Courtney Love? Go on. Okay then. That is that. Uh, this is rock. This is that. this is rock and roll. Okay. Right. Courtney Love, we were in the same hotel as her. In America, four seasons. OK, and Melanie Brown and I, OK, gave her a little call and said that we were Amanda Decadene's best pal. Okay. And we told her that we was in a rock group. Right. We went up to her room okay. and, and watched... sat in her front room and she told us her life story, thinking that we were Amanda, Amanda Decadene's friends. Me. Right, and we watched we Congo weren't. on video. Until this day... She, she thinks. thinks. <laughs> doesn't she okay. doesn't know. She had nothing on but a pair of knickers. She had. She, 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 she was sitting there in her pants. <laughs> she's just sitting there wearing pants. Looking and very yeah. grey. She looks Look, grey and blue. Well, I suppose it was, you could no, see. I feel didn't horrible. You? Actually. Yeah, well, yeah, well, that's that's nice. That is a bit of a confession. So a number of she things. Want to be give it. So a number of things that you're confessing to. First of all, slapping Ulrika Johnson. Secondly, pretending to be friends of Amanda Decadene. And thirdly, watching Congo on a video. Now that. <laughs> I yeah. mean, of all the things, I mean, that, that is, is just the worst that film is ever sad, made. sad, isn't it? Yeah, it is. The Confessions Podcast. A classic confession from the Spice Girls. The thing is with the celebrity confessions, they were f they were very unpredictable because we didn't really know what they were going to say ahead of time. Really? Yeah, they weren't actually checked through. Wow. So there are... So, there, Imagine that. Yes, well, there are some... Um, like, really? there are some... Who, I don't know if anyone listening remembers Daryl Hall doing a live confession. That was pretty shocking. Richard Marks, that was pretty shocking. Wow, really? Yeah. Anyway, so they won't be going out again, either. Oh, right. Sister Bobby, you forgave two this week. 50-50, yeah. Uh, that takes your yearly tally to 57 forgives and 61 not forgivens. OK. There's a league chart here. I'm much Good. more generous than I thought. Matt, you yeah. forgave three people uh, this Forgiving week. Person. Takes you to seven, seven, 77 forgives for this Correct. year and 42 not forgives. So, basically, I see the good in people, Bobby. Oh, do I you think really? Is that what you see? That's what we're all taking from that. I think you have a lower morals yes, so than I, I do. Yes, I do. Morals of a sewer, sewer rat. That's the one. <laughs> if you made it to the end of the last podcast, you had to tweet... Why the big gap, Big Sean? For reasons I can't remember. Thank you to Rick, Leanne, Barbie, Louis, Steve and many more who did just that. This week's top code phrase is... I have a woman's head in my bag. <laughs> Imagine tweeting that. Don't forget you can hear the whole radio show every weekday from 5 on BBC Radio 2. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you. Thanks for listening. The Confessions Podcast. Go in peace. <laughs>